let's avoid that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Easier for me if there's less editing, but no, no, no big deal. <laughs> okay, hello everybody and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Adam, and today we have a very special guest, Grazielli. Is that, did I get that right? Yes, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> perfect might be overselling, but I, I try, I try. Um, so our guest this week is going to CompSciCon Canada, just like me. Um, not actually going, we're, we're attending from home. But uh, yeah, uh, we're in the same boat. So I thought maybe yeah. we'd uh, chat with a couple of these uh, attendees and uh, get to know everyone. Um, so where do you go to school? You're a, a grad student, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'm pleased. Uh Hi, Adam. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and <laughs> I was just thinking that virtual going is the new kind of going, right? <laughs> so, yeah, like, yeah, that's right. So attendance. <laughs> I'm going to my living room and sitting down. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Gracieli. I'm a PhD candidate in ecology and evolution. I'm going, I currently work in at the Université de Montréal here in Canada, but I'm also working in, at Universidade Federal de Goiás, back in Brazil. Um, and my research, can I talk about my research now? Yes, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, my research is about uh, species interactions and how does this plays a role in species distribution. So I'm super curious on understanding uh, how like uh, competition, predation, and things like that uh, the limits species distributions. Um, and, but I do that without having to go to the field because I do that as a theoretical ecologist. So I, I get to simulate virtual worlds in my computer and get species to fight <laughs> and to collaborate <laughs> and to test my ideas. That's really cool. So actually I was going to ask you about that. Um, I've spoken to some uh, researchers who do field work in that sort of area. Um, when it comes to the theoretical stuff, you say you do a lot of computer modeling. Can you maybe give a very brief description of like what goes into a model or uh, what like a result looks like for you? Yeah, sure. Um, it depends on your model, but there are a lot of things that you have to address when you build a model. Uh, but basically you have to think of all the factors that can influence uh, your variables. Uh, and all of that goes into your model as parameters. So you have to think about that and you have to, uh, for example, I simulate virtual species, but I have to think about what is the growth rate of them. Do they have like three siblings or they have a thousand? <laughs> uh, how do they fight? Do, what's the effect of one species on another? Do they kill uh, every every puppets that, sure, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. that are born, <laughs> things like that. And the outcome is are pretty much <laughs> line graphs. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I get to understand how are the dynamics of the populations based on, uh, I get to see a graph with the number of individuals for species, for example, in a certain amount of time, in a time series, things like that, or I can do a heat map, for example, uh, and then I can see the distribution of the most abundant species or the less abundant. Okay, so maybe um, maybe a misconception could be that like uh, when you do these sort of computer simulations, you're creating like almost like a video game type scenario where you get to watch these animals, but that's, that's definitely not the case. It's more math-based, you get a number out, you plot the you'd have to have a, a great imagination to, to really draw the picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But sometimes it can feel like a video game when you do like immediate plots of heat maps uh -huh. and you can see one species is expanding and the other one contracting. And things. You get to see them moving, but uh -huh. not like a video game. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I've heard um, some models that I don't know if they like started off in ecology or if they started off in like economics or something, anything like that. But I've sometimes heard analogies between uh, some like standard ecology models and like bidding wars or like 
Um, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of models in ecology were born in economy or physics okay. even. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like, Darwin had that idea of competition and uh, the survival of the fittest and what we now know as the uh, carrying capacity. Mm. Okay. It was an idea born in, in economy from Malthus. That he said that we wouldn't have resources for everyone, so the population would reach a, a stable point. Mm -hmm. So we use that a lot in ecology. Okay. And as far as um, training goes for you um, to get to where you are now, I'm assuming lots and lots of math, applied math, uh, yeah. di differential equations. You probably are very good at solving <laughs> those. <laughs> I wish I was, <laughs> but I think the most important thing uh, for listeners who want to adventure in theoretical ecology is not to be afraid of math. Like I was, I always liked math, but I was never that good. So I always have to go back to the books to relearn something. Uh, but we apply a lot of that in our models. And also programming language is really uh, important because you get to, it, it's really uh, flexible. You get to build the model the way you want. And it's, uh, it, it addresses a really specific problem of reproducibility. So you can build a model that everyone can replicate. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like... Um when math becomes like applied to like a biological system or something like that, it's a little bit easier for like me to understand. I've never been good at like math for math's sake, but when it's like describing something that I can actually think about, then, then I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once you understand the basic stuff and like, I think that in nature, this will happen this way. And uh -huh. then you remember there is something in mathematics that can describe that. So, I heard, that, I heard that's how Einstein liked to think about stuff. He would just draw a bunch of pictures and think about stuff qualitatively. And then after the fact, yeah. try to find the math to make it work. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. So I'm feeling good now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, you are uh, into all this research, but you're also apparently very much into science communication, hence going to ComSciCon Canada. Um, so has this always been something that you've been interested in or has the like communicating research, um, been like a, a new focus for you? What, what brings you to SciComm? Uh, that's actually a very long dream <laughs> like, since I was a kid because I was really, really lucky to have access to science communication in diverse media since I was really young like in magazines and TV shows and newspapers. And I was, I was lucky to have a really inspiring family also. Like my sister, my older sister was the first one to go to college. And so she brought a lot, a lot of new ways to think of research things. Um, and, and then I remember the, as a kid, dreaming of being a scientist in the morning and a science communicator in the afternoon, even though I didn't knew this was a thing. <laughs> so I oh. wanted to go to a magazine and write texts about science. <laughs> well, there you go. That, that seems yeah. like the split that you've, uh, you've attained at this point. <laughs> yeah. No, right now, it's pretty much only research. <laughs> yeah. I have uh, some time to science communication, but I hope one day I'll have Mm -hmm. The morning for science and the afternoon for science communication. Did you, was there ever like a, a very uh, important TV show or magazine, like one that sticks out in your mind as being very inspirational? Yeah, well, I, I remember I was addicted to Big Man's World. I don't know if everybody knows that, but in Brazil it's quite popular. Okay, and I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's a mad scientist and he has a green... Uh, green suit and there's a big rat as a it's a human rat <laughs> okay <laughs> it's really crazy and i know uh that they try to make the show for kids but also actually uh 
a lot of adults adults uh, were interested in the show. So the main public of the show was were adults. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we also had in Brazil, we had a couple of science communication magazines, uh, Super Interessante. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, <laughs> that's one of those things that I kind of like to ask people. It seems people coming from different cultures, there's different amounts of like science media. It seems like Europe is very steeped in, you know, accessible science, especially France. They seem very passionate about it. Ontario, not so much, especially compared to Quebec. Quebec seems like they're, it's, it's very big for them. Um, was that big for you growing up? Was like everybody into something science-based or was science very accessible for you? Or was that something you had to go out of your way to find? Uh, for me, it was quite easy, but I, I know I was really privileged okay As, like growing up uh, we had a in brazil we have a public channel tv channel that had a lot of educational prog programs the tv shows mm -hmm. uh, so for me it was quite easy to have access to them but uh, museums it depends because i lived in a lot of cities in brazil depending on where i lived it was more easier or difficult right. um but I know uh, we have a lot of problems with that in Brazil because we are a really big country and the museums, the science centers are really clustered in the cities. So it's hard for a kid from the, from the, banlieue, <laughs> from the, the most uh, far parts of the city to access the museums, the city centers. Mm, okay. uh, so there are a lot of, actually now we have a lot of science communication uh, projects that try to bring those science centers to these more uh, far communities. So okay, that's really important. Yeah. I feel like Canada is somewhat similar to that too with like Northern Ontario. There's always these uh, initiatives to uh, be more inclusive of the more Northern provinces and stuff. That's a, mm. that's a tough problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, right. So, uh, as far as this conference goes, um, have you been to any conferences like this before or is this a first? Um, not really. I was once selected to go to a camp, uh, in Brazil, uh, it was promoted by an institution called Serra Pilheira. Uh, they selected about, I think, 50 or 40 projects, science communication projects, to go to this camp to have uh, two, three days of training and to get to know each other. And then they would be, uh, they would be able to submit a proposal to get a finance, mm -hmm. to get funding to, to the projects. Uh, so it was a really interesting uh, opportunity, but other than that, I don't think I went to a conference of science communication. Okay. More uh, satellite events in academic conference, things like that. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty exciting that they're putting this sort of thing on. I, I've only very recently started to, to see these things popping up. Um, applying for this and going for this uh, conference? Is there anything in particular you're hoping to get out of it or hoping to learn um, from these, these uh, workshops? Sure. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting idea to have this conference uh, and especially because it's aimed at grad students and made by grad students and everything. Uh, myself, I co-lead a training project in science communication. So I, I always, I'm always curious to get to know how people do those trainings and to get new ideas and to learn new things because I, I was never formally trained in science communication. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like I need this training the, as much as possible, as much as I can get. Um, and because the project that I co-lead along with Dr. Maria Leticia Bonatelli back in Brazil too, um, it's a collaborative project, so I get I hope to get contributors in this conference too. People are interested in having a satellite 
version of the project in their own cities and to expand. Okay, so tell me about this project. This is this is not your 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 research project. This is a another communication based project. Yeah, <laughs> that was something that was born in the halls of the university because I was always uh, doing a, a little blog post here, Twitter there, science communication, and people were like, "How can you do that?" Like, <laughs> we were never trained to do this. And I was, I'm so shy, I don't know where to start. And I was like, I just started to do. <laughs> and I got uh, really supportive people that helped me with feedback. So I thought that maybe what was missing was a space for people to get confidence to try new things and to gather people that already know how to do it, to teach and to uh, to to try to get these people that are shy to try new things. Yeah, sort of a mentorship type of type of. Yes, thing. yes, perfect. That's it. So this idea was born: uh, how to make a collaborative training science communication. And then I applied to Mozilla Open Leaders to develop this project. So it's a mentoring program of I think it's 12, 15 weeks where we develop the project into a minimal viable product. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, I got the fundings from Mozilla too, to have uh, an in-person training. So last year was really productive. We had about four trainings, I think, five in person. And it's really, really fun because it's really unconventional. It's quite a um, unconference. Have you heard of it? On conference? Yes. It, um, I think I've seen that as like a hashtag floating around. I, I just assumed it was any translation from in-person conference to virtual conference, but that sounds like no. I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, like a, an unconference is almost a conference uh, reverted where participants are the main responsibles for the, for the content of the conference. So the way that the training goes is that we get, we, the, the instructors uh, give low input of content, but we, uh, we have a lot of uh, hands-on activities. So participants discover their own potential in science uh, communication. Okay. That's awesome. And, uh, and you've run some of these already? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> last year we had a, a lot, uh, uh -huh. we had, different formats too. We had the first one was five days, morning and afternoon was really extenuating. And less just this week we had the first online training. It was Ah, okay. I was gonna ask about that. How how was that? <laughs> yeah, it was a challenge because we we spent the whole day doing a lot of activities. We go uh we walk around, we build things with our own hands. And doing that online was like, mm, will that work? <laughs> right, right. It turned out it worked because we focused more on blog posts and Twitter and the basics of science communication. Mm -hmm. So we get people in breakout rooms in Zoom for them to discuss things and to write things on etherpads. So it, it works. It worked. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something that I've been very interested in um, since all of this um, stay at home business, uh, basically how conferences are getting translated to virtual. Um, so it sounds like you, you used Zoom for certain aspects of it. Um, did you use any other software or um, programs that you would recommend or that seemed useful? For conferences, for trainings? Uh, yeah, anything that uh, you use that might be useful um, for, you know, getting people together and, and putting stuff mm -hmm. on. Yeah, that's hard because it depends a lot of, of what people are familiar with and... Okay. Yeah, so right now I'm using pretty much everything is in Zoom. Okay. Uh, I guess the uh, the major barrier is just to have people willing to get on the platform and and yeah. my my experience has been it, it most of these programs work it's just 
like opti like finding the, the best possible one isn't really the problem. It's mostly just get get everybody in a place and it'll it'll work out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, sometimes I re I'm a bit concerned about privacy Zoom, but uh -huh. well, <laughs> we can get everything right. <laughs> There's yeah. uh, this other platform that I saw that I used once. It's called Whereby. Okay. I don't know if it's better in privacy than Zoom, but it works quite well too. Yeah, I feel like as far as I'm concerned, the stuff that I do is not very uh, secret or private. So <laughs> if somebody wants to drop in and listen, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, so another aspect of this conference, it actually sounds like this is something that uh, your workshops would have also done, but uh, there's a write-a-thon aspect. How's that coming? Have you have you managed to get your draft ready? Uh, quite. Not. It, okay. It's in the pre-draft phase. <laughs> Does that mean all up here or? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm trying to build a story up here. <laughs> okay. And I know what I want to say, the aspect, the theme, but I need to do a little bit of research. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably the first time I tried to do science communication in English, in another language that is not Portuguese. Ah, okay. So, yeah, it's quite challenging. Yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> like science communication within one language is sort of a translation problem unto itself. And now you're putting yes. like, several layers on it. Yeah, uh, but that, that was quite a, one of my goals for this year was to expand my science communication in to other languages. So I applied also to Soapbox Science here mm -hmm. in Canada. So I could try to do that in English. I did in Portuguese last year. And I was, okay, I have, I have to expand and try new things and to uh -huh. have new challenge. So I'll try that. <laughs> wow, I can't imagine. I'm trying to teach myself French um, because I feel like it's my, my duty being a Canadian to know a little bit of French. And <laughs> boy, that, that's, that sounds tough. <laughs> yes. We should study together because I studied French for seven years now and I can't have ah. a conversation in French. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if I can read stuff off of like a, a website or, you know, out of a book that I'm, I'm doing all right. I can't do that yet, but <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, the, the fact that you have other languages that you have access to, is there, do you think there are avenues for you to get into like translation? Like, um, is that something you've looked into for yourself as like a, a, a job or something you could offer? Yeah, yeah. I did that for a while for echography, but it didn't turn out uh, as expected. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I don't think people are really interested in doing this, but it's sure something that I would do. Okay. And I think it's important. Uh, for example, in ecography, there are a lot of uh, Brazilian researchers that published there. And I feel like it would be really, really useful to have those blog posts uh, or lay summaries in Portuguese for people that have a lot of difficulties in, in English, mm -hmm. which is a, a lot of people in Brazil. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many resources available to English speakers. Um. Yes. <laughs> this is one of the aspects of science that people are, try, are, are beginning to acknowledge that people that are not native to English already start a, a step back in science because they have to learn, they have to try to write in English. And there are always a review that <laughs> rejects the paper and asks, for, for example, to ask a native English speaker to be a co-author, and that's terrible. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that should, um, that's, that's tough. That's, uh, I definitely benefit from being able to read all of these English things. I, it really does seem unfair that uh, other, other people have to translate into my language. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be like that the whole day, like, mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's these barriers in science. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think like, would I end up in science if I had to learn another language to partake? I, I was never really one for languages, so I probably wouldn't end up in science. That's, that's a weird thought. Yeah. That's something that everybody needs to think about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 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 maybe I was privileged to get to get involved in Mozilla community since a couple of years now. Huh. Uh, but they talk about that all the time. There are a lot of projects trying to assess that, how to be more inclusive in, for example, peer review. Uh, right. The people from the pre-review project, which is a platform for reviewing pre preprints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they try to address that a lot, how to be more inclusive in, uh, in the review process and how to get more people from other languages to, uh, to be included in the, in the scientific, in the academic publication process. Yeah, I wonder if, I mean, since journals need to be profitable apparently, uh, in a world where that wasn't the case, I wonder if there would be, uh, like, if they could have some translators hired on as like a, when a draft is submitted, they can go through and, and sort of pick through the obvious grammar and, and stuff before reviewers see it, because that's certainly going to bias reviewers if they have yeah. to, if they have to interpret it for themselves. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's, that's a big problem with academia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of problems connected to that. Uh -huh. For example, sometimes your English in the paper is perfect, but if your name says that you're not from the United States, the review may be like, mm, your English is not perfect. You shouldn't use, if you use mm. that word, you're not an English native speaker, so you should try to have a review on that. Um, there are a lot of cases that I've heard of from that. Oh, that's and, horrible. Yeah, and the other problem is money because to to afford someone to review your English, it's really expensive in Brazil, for example. Mm -hmm. And the fees to publish are <laughs> really high. You can get like three months of a grad student salary in Brazil. So. Oh, that's, that's brutal. Yeah. I wonder if like, uh, so I'm a part of the, the American Physical Society. That's like the overarching research society that most physicists are a part of. I wonder if these sort of societies have like grants or bursaries or whatever for um, just quick translations, if that's something that they would look into doing because yeah, it's really unfair that anybody who, you know, wasn't born speaking English would have to, you know, foot that bill. Yeah. That that's a great idea. Like to have a society, a small grant for that, that would be good. Yeah. I don't know. I should ask around and maybe look into that. I'm sure some group has already figured out that to some extent, they might be a smaller group or something, but that's interesting. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, can I pick your brain a little bit about what your write-a-thon topic is, or or do you want to keep it private until? <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. Okay. Maybe if I make a public commitment, <laughs> yeah, <it'll> be. <laughs> like... <laughs> so uh, I've been uh, trying to play around a little bit with uh, product design <laughs> in the last couple of months. Um, because I've always been interested in that since I was a kid with the art class. <laughs> okay. And, and now I have a friend that he's a, a, a woodworker. He, he does um, furniture in wood. So we are playing with that, like to concept new and different uh, furniture. So I had an idea of trying to maybe connect ecology and types of wood. And Oh, okay. Yeah. And the last few days, I was researching about different schools of interior design. So we have like the Scandinavian design <laughs> and the Irish design. They have different kinds of wood that are prevalent. So in Irish design, they have more dark wood and the Scandinavian are more cl uh, light, clear, like a, a light 
tone of uh, brown. Yeah, people seem to love that the teak look or whatever it is that Scandinavian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering uh, if there's something in ecology that could explain that, or is if it's just cultural. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, if it's like born from this is the wood that we have like native to our area, or is it like a an aesthetic? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I would love to read that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> And also there's the aspect of the, the cost of the wood. For example, in Brazil, we have a lot of uh, a wood that, that's more hard and more dark. <laughs> it's cheaper for us, but to build the same furniture here, it would be super expensive. Right, okay. Maybe oh. I'll try to address that. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, when you're writing it, have you thought about like... Um, what your audience, like your your ideal audience would be for this? Like, is this, are you hoping to make this something that like a general public would read or for more like a science, science-y type um, audience? Do you, do you have a plan for that? Yeah, I never try to address everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. For now, I was thinking more of a millennial <laughs> crew, okay. people that are interested in design and um, that, that has Pinterest in their phones. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay. Cool. That sounds fun. Um, so that's kind of the uh, the extent of the questions that I had prepared, more or less. Um, anything you want to sort of shout out or, or talk about or advertise before, uh, before I let you go? Uh, sure. Uh, in Brazil, we have a lot of psych commerce, <laughs> have a, a, a good science communication community. Uh, I have a list on GitHub if anyone is interested in what's going on in science communication in Brazil. Oh, if you could share that with me on Twitter, that would be awesome. Yeah, and sure. I can attach that to this. Good. Uh, it, it's really interesting because people are trying new things. There are people that are getting together as a kind of society to mm -hmm. uh, to filter what's good science channels in, on YouTube, for example, the science blogs in Brazil. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of the community back in Brazil because they are awesome. They, they have a, a great history. There are, uh, for example, the science blogs, mm -hmm. that's kind of the same people that run the science blogs now. They are active for more than 10 years now. And they are, they are just awesome. <laughs> Great, yeah, I'd love to uh, to check that out. And also, if uh, if you can give me any sort of more information or links or to to your project, I would love to check that out too. Sure. <laughs> are you preparing a poster for the conference? Uh, no, not this time. Ah, okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much. It was great meeting you. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Great to meet you too. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to read your work and. Uh, I mean, we'll see you uh, in virtual Toronto, I guess. Yes, <laughs> virtual Toronto. <laughs> cool. Okay. And w would you mind if I contacted you after the fact or after the conference to do a little debriefing? Would that be? No, no, sure. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again. It was uh, it's great having you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Bye. You too.